Hello, everyone, and welcome to another interview of Sonic Perspectives. I'm Rodrigo, and we have also on the call Samantha Buckman. Hi, Samantha. Hello. And Jonathan Smith. Hi there. Hey. And our guest today is a powerhouse drummer, a man whose energy is even more infectious than the COVID I'm struggling with right now. I call him the Rocky Balboa of drums, Mr. John Macaluso. John, thank you for joining us. You're talking to me? No, wrong character. Adrian! <laughs> That's right. Thanks, thanks for having me on. You guys are the best, man. Thanks for having me on. I'm really happy. Our pleasure, you. yeah. And it's been a while since we did an interview, and I believe the first time we talked uh, was when the first Michael Romeo album came out, War of the Worlds Part 1. And right. now Part 2 came out, and it's just as awesome as the first one. I like it better, but thanks, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it's album of the year so far for me, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah? <laughs> That's yeah. cool. I'm yeah. going to mail you another $20 tomorrow. No, no <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, bro. I'm really happy with it. It's yeah. a killer. And from what I gathered, uh, there was a little bit more involvement from you on this one. There's even a song that was created for you, Alien Death Rays, right? Alien Death Ray. Yeah. yeah I mean, Romeo called me and he said, um, but the funny thing is we did that take on the first album. Mm. And I was mad because he didn't put on the record. He's like, how do you like the record? I was like, it's okay. <laughs> no, no. But um, we did it in the first session. And like Malmsteen on uh, the song Quantum Leap, the last yes. song was a drum solo. So Romeo did the, the same thing. He did the right thing. <laughs> right. But yeah, he said, he said, I want to write it. Uh, he wanted to do a tune a little bit like Stravinsky mm. and like kind of like when Dave Weckl does the drum kicks, you know, but a different right. style of music. So he wrote that and he sent it and he said, just do your thing, man. And <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah. And uh, on, on your YouTube channel, there's a few snippets of you recording the drums for this album. Uh, it would be great if you could do a full playthrough of the album. Is there any chance of that happening or? Yeah, I mean, maybe you guys could help because um, I was just thinking I got to do one of these playthrough videos. So. Mm. I had three songs in mind. Tell me what you think. Okay. Destroyer, Destroyer, Metamorphosis, or Alien Death Ray? I yeah. think, what do you think? Well, Alien Death Ray has to be there for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Another, another 20 is coming tomorrow. Yes. Well, the other two are the singles, I think, right? So, yeah, they should be there for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I got to get with the times and start doing all this video thing. I'm still, yeah. I'm, I'm still kind of old school. Kind right. of. You know. Got it. But uh, I'm going to get with this and make some videos and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So looking back at the time elapsed between the War of the Worlds albums and considering that there was a global pandemic between the two, what would you say was different in the creative and recording process between them? And what stayed the same? Um, for drums, I did the second. OK, we did the first album. And I recorded 19 songs. So Mike was going to use it for both records. But then, of course, he's always writing and inventing new stuff. So he said, oh, I got five more songs. Yeah. So I went, I went back to the studio. This is right before COVID. We just started to hear about COVID. And I was in a place called San Marino where we did the first album. And I did the five other songs. My wife came to pick me up with the drums. And she said, uh, when we go back to... Back home, we got to go into this lockdown. And I was in lockdown way before everybody here because where I recorded was like a red zone, you know? Right. So um, the difference is, um, wow. I mean, it, the crazy thing is the album title and the kind of the lyrics kind of fit what's happening now. And that wasn't planned yeah. from Mike. You know, it kind of fits what's happening in the world and the COVID thing. And it's strange. It's like double meanings to the words. Yeah. You know, yes. but um, I, I like um, the second one more. I just don't know why. It just, um, I don't know. I was more psyched. I was more excited doing the second one. I was on the first one too, but when you get one album done and it's good, you want to beat it. So, yeah. you know, beat it. I hope we did. Yes. Yeah. And I saw that you reposted on Facebook, this guy doing the Romeo solo on Divide and Conquer on the flute. How amazing was Unbelievable. that? Unbelievable. <laughs> I said, this guy needs a day job, man. He's got too much yeah. time on his hands. <laughs> but it's pretty sick. That was great, man. Yeah, I added him on Facebook afterwards. He's a fellow Brazilian, actually. He's pretty good. Yeah, yeah I think he's like a Jersey guy. He's Brazilian. 
Oh, but just, I said, I'm, it's like I'm in New Jersey. I just can't imagine some New Jersey guy <laughs> doing it on the flute. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I love that you reunited with Dino on this album. And I wish the other band you guys uh, had was successful as well, Stone Leaders. Uh, I spoke with him in early 2020. He was surprised that I knew about Stone Leaders too. Yeah, me too. But I, I would have been really surprised, but I sent you the record. So I know you heard it. <laughs> no, but... um. Yeah, I mean, we met a while back. We met before the Stone Leaders, and he was a fan of Ark and Yon Landa. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the first time I met him, he was talking about Ark. If I ever wanted to do anything, you know, Ark cover songs or whatever, keep him in mind. So, right. you know, we were recording the Stone Leaders album, and um, then we got him on half the album, you know, for vocals and played keys. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, he's a killer. Yeah, yeah. All right, absolutely. Well, I'm kind of the resident Malmstein fanatic here, so my ah. questions have to do with the work that you did with him. And okay. uh, so anyway, uh, one of the things I noticed about the two albums that you appeared on was that the drums were mixed uh, way differently compared to previous Ingway albums. That's when his uh, sound started to get real raw and kind of modernized, particularly on War to End All Wars. And so I wanted to ask you some questions uh, specifically about the, uh, the post-production process but even also just the record how things were mic'd all the technical stuff and was that whole thing uh, was that more you or was that more Ingve uh, that ended up with that final result it's always him mm. you know, what happened was the first album have you heard of Chris Tangridis he's a producer yeah he, he, he passed away now he's a great guy mm. um, you know he worked with everybody uh, a classic guy a classic producer so the first album We did it where they did Heaven and Hell. Mm. And we walked in and Chris knew someone and asked him, where did they set the drums up for Heaven and Hell? The guy's like, right there. I said, Chris, let's go. So we put the drums in the exact spot. Now, I don't know what's the real story here, but for some, Chris worked with Led Zeppelin. Maybe he was a runner to get the bagels or go get the coffee. But he was in the studio during one of those albums. Think about that. Yeah. So he told me, he showed me the exact way they mic'd the kit. We tried it. It did not work because it's John Bonham. Sorry. You know what I mean? You can't get that sound. Yeah. So anyway, we started miking things. And um, I think he worked on Painkiller, Judas Priest also. I think he did something there. So we had a sound similar to Painkiller. It was amazing. And then in the middle of the production, they had a little bit of a, or a big problem. And Chris yeah. left. You know, and I was new to the whole thing. I'm a session drummer. I'm used to going in playing and I go home and a year later, the mail, it, the album comes in the mail. I even forgot about it. I'm like, oh, here it is. <laughs> Most of the time it was like a Frisbee because the drums were mixed weird because you're not in control. Right. But um, yeah, so Chris left the first album after the drums were done. And then Ingve kind of took over and got someone else. But the final result compared to what it was is not good. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. The second album is a weird thing, and I'm, you know, I love the engineer. I love the, he's a good friend of mine, but he was like, um, I think he saw, um, Brian, if you're watching, I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> he started to mic my, my toms, which are double-headed, okay? There's a head on the top and there's a head on the bottom. He put mics on top and he put one on the bottom. I said, what the hell are you doing? Oh, no, 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 this is one of my methods, you know what I mean? So Ingrid's letting him go, do his thing. Because Ingve had a new video game, like a, a dogfight airplane game. And all day long, you would hear, yeah, da, 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 yeah, man, yeah. So he was playing dogfight in the other room. <laughs> and um, me and Brian were getting the sounds. And when you got a mic on the top and a mic on the bottom, you could get interfacing. You could, it can choke the sound. And from the very beginning of that album, I was like, what the hell is he doing? And then when I went to his house one night, we were drinking some beers, went to his house. I saw a Dream Theater album on his kitchen table. Mm. And on the back was um, a photo of the studio. And I saw Top and Mike Toms. It was the first time I've ever seen it. So I'm like, I called him on it. I'm like, wait a minute. Are you like, are you just doing this because you see the photo? No, 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 no. <laughs> in, in, the, in the end, no matter what we did, it's always going to be Ingrid taking over. And that's the way it is. So I think... Maybe on this one, he put his son, who was free at the time, on the dials. Maybe he put him on, because the result, <laughs> the result came to me. And I was like, what the hell is that? And good thing I had Burn the Sun, which came out like a couple of days later. 
to mm. redeem myself. Because a lot of people don't know it's not the drummer's fault, man. <laughs> you know? But yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not happy with the sound. The first album, you know, but I got to tell you, War to End All Wars has fucking so, amazing songs and the playing is great. But the sound just killed it. You know? Yeah. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was trying to be polite, but yeah, War to End oh, no. no. was okay. sadly the maybe the second, but I would argue the the worst produced album that he ever put out. It's kind of neck and neck with Attack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But but now, I mean, as much as I love him and his style and his brilliance, um, it seems like he's just programming like a 1980 drum machine. Yes, and doing everything. Uh, I actually liked when he sang in the show. He did like two Hendrix songs, but a whole album. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. But um. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, you know, the drummer doesn't have much control. But it's again, I respect him big time. I'm not insulting here, but on in, an interview I read after that album came out, I guess so many people were complaining. He wrote the album sounds that way because the drummer couldn't hit hard enough. I mean, it doesn't get more <laughs> opposite. <laughs> Really? <laughs> I was going to accuse you of hitting the drums too hard when I heard it. <laughs> maybe. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> and uh, I'm in two minds about asking you about this, but feel free to dodge the question if you want. But I don't know if you saw the news about the recent uh, spat between Malmsteen and Jeff Scott Soto. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently Jeff was in the audience at a Malmsteen show and he, and he said, you know, if Jeff doesn't leave, I'm, I'm not going to play. I mean, I believe it. <laughs> okay. And, and that's uh, the end of that. Oh. Jeff, Jeff came on some of the gigs. I, I mean, I was a big fan. Marching Out is my favorite Malmsteen album. So yeah, we did a couple of gigs and, and Jeff came to the shows. I got to meet him. I got to know him. And he's a great dude. But when I read that story, I mean, right away, I said, true. Mm. And it's a shame, <laughs> man. It's a shame. There's a lot involved in that whole thing. Right. You know? yeah. I just got to say, when Ingbe's on his own and it's me and him, he's a blast. You know, it, it's... Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of weird things that can happen, but uh, that's terrible. Understood. Uh, so Jeff left the show? He had I to, I guess. He, I think he did, yeah. And the, and uh, there's a lot of comments on the internet. I'm not going to go into that, but yeah, the, that's the uh, spat at the moment, but yeah. <laughs> funny, thing, funny thing about Malmsteen, if I did the things he did, or you, we would lose our audience and people would be pissed. The more he Just does like stuff that. like that, the more attractive it is. Yeah, I think so. People flock to it. I don't know. Yeah. You know, it's just him, man. Maybe it does it on purpose. I don't know. Ah, <laughs> low key. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I was wondering, is there any kind of routine that you follow while fans just to keep your drumming skills in shape at this point in your career? Yeah, like, um, uh, it's it, two good things divided into one. I live in Italy, and in Italy, uh, as a foreigner, um, I can drive, but I didn't know because I got pulled over one night uh. um, and, and uh, the, the Carabinieri, which is like the police, but a little more military. Mm. They said, uh, you've been here over a year, so now you're illegal. So you're allowed to drive as a tourist for one year. I'm like, who made that rule? And then they step out of the car. They started messing with me. And then it, this is Italy. One of them goes, ah, ha, ha, and hits me on the back. He goes, you're Sicilian. So am I. Macaluso, get out of here. Yeah. So I got, I got back in the car and I drove away. But I'm not allowed to drive here right now. So what I do, I walk to my rehearsal studio every day. It's about six miles. And I play for three hours a day. If I'm working or just jamming, I make sure three hours a day. And then I walk home. So wow. yeah, I'm trying to get into a routine and actually be a better drama. You know, I'm, I'm ready for that. It's a great feeling when you're, you know, you've been playing for years and actually you see yourself even getting better. So watch out for the next album. It's going to kill. But yeah, routine wise, I mean, that's what I do. The practice and, um, you know, I'm working on my drum book. I'm almost done with that. I've been saying that for five years, but that's coming out. And um, no, trying to get healthy. <laughs> So one of the one of my favorite things you did was Union Radio, uh, and there's even a song there with James Labrie on vocals as well. Uh, oh. I think that project could have gone a lot further too, right? Um, the Union Radio was strange because I okay, I always wrote lyrics mm. when I was a kid. You know, before I was playing drums, I was writing lyrics. And Mooney, Mooney, Mooney says hello, <laughs> my dog. Basta. Named after Keith Moon, right? Named after yeah. Keith Moon, but he hates noise. 
<laughs> if I hit a symbol, he won't, he, he, he'll be like out of the room for three days. He oh, hates it. Yeah, but uh, Union Radio, so basically, you know, the first time, uh, the first week playing drums, me and my across the street neighbor, we put a band together and he just had the top string of a guitar. So I'm like, okay, you're the bassist. So we started to write songs in my parents' basement. You know what I mean? And I'll tell you our first hit. This was the first hit. First song I ever wrote. Ready? Mm. Swimming in a pool ooh, is very cool, is very cool. Swimming <laughs> in a pool. Ooh. It's a summer song. Swimming in a right. pool is very cool. All right? <laughs> no, but I took that whole thing. Like I wrote lyrics with Ark, me and Yon Landa on Burn the Sun. And then when it came time to do a solo album, I never did a solo album. And I, I like... I was with Marcus. I recorded all the drums in New York, and then I traveled around the world, um, visiting and, and playing with my best musicians I knew. So it was like, um, you know, jump on a plane, go to Italy, jump on a plane, go to, um, you know, different countries and stuff and towns, and working with some of my favorite musicians. So the drums were done. The first place I go is to Italy with Marcus Foley, who I met when I was touring with James LeBrie, great right. guitar player. Yeah. So I give him the track. Here's the drum track. And he goes, okay, what do you want? I was like, well, just jam on it. Jam on it. What do you want me to play? You have to show me what to play. And I'm like, oh, man, is this the way this is going to work? I thought he was just going to rip it up. And I remember I went in the bathroom and I'm freaking I'm like, what am I going to tell this guy? And I came up with a melody for guitar. And I walked out of the bathroom. I'm like, play this. He did it. And he did it good. And that's what I, that's when I realized I can do this. I don't have to play an instrument to actually mm. write the music. I just try to sing in my tone deaf voice. And if somebody's talented enough to decipher what I did, you can make a great album. Right. And that, that's how it started, man. Right. And then I got Labrie because I, I toured with them. I toured with James and um, yeah. Michael. So I called him and I just pretty much got most of my favorite people, the union radio. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think on Union Radio and Stone Leaders, you're kind of chasing the, chasing the ARC sound. And I believe there's a plan to reissue the ARC catalog as well. What's the latest on that? Uh, the ARC thing, it's kind of like, you know, me and a guitar player, Tora, we were writing mm -hmm. the songs for like maybe six or eight months, months before we went into record. So... With Stone Leaders, it was the same. It was me and a guitar player writing the songs. And with a lot of these projects, it's me and the other guy. So it's obviously mm. going to have that arc thing. Right. You know, because I'm on it. And then lyrically, it's the same. Because me and Yon did the lyrics for Burn the Sun. And I did the lyrics for Stone Leaders. Okay. So it's, I always try to do those double meanings where you don't know if it's about this or that. You know, mm -hmm. I never really, I never really give it to them like she's hot. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> Try yeah. to have a little mystery. And as far as the Ark catalog, there, there is something big happening for Ark. Uh, it's not announced yet. It's not a reunion, not a new album, but it's really exciting, and I'm psyched about it. So okay. I'm going to tell you when I'm allowed. But in the next two months, there's big Ark news. Got it. Okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah, back to Union Radio. Thanks, man. Because um. That I always say, and all the, everybody on the album really did an amazing job. And you know, you know who your friends are when you have to move out of your apartment on a Saturday afternoon, and when you have to make a solo album. That's <laughs> when you know your true friends. <laughs> That's such a cool line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, who were your favorite drummers when you were growing up? Which drummer would you say really inspired you? to, you know, pick up the drumsticks. And who's your favorite now? Good question. Uh, okay. My, the, I was going to buy a guitar when I was a kid. It was 1979. I think I was 10. No, was like nine or something. I was a young lad. And yeah. um, we were going, driving with my mother and my sister to go buy a guitar. It was like, because it was like a Jimmy Page looking um, Les Paul, Sunburst. And we were going to buy it, and I saw a drum set in a garage sale, and I was like, stop the car. I want to play drums. Because I, the color is what did it. It's crazy, but true. It was an orange drum set, and I was a big Who fan. And the movie Tommy, Keith Moon, has an orange drum set, and he kicks it over, and I was like, you know, I was a big <laughs> Who fan. So for some reason, I was meant to be 
the orange drums, uh, I thought of Moon. I said, forget the guitar. We got the drums, $20, brought them home. And I, I still, it's still like I was 11 years old again. Like I never grew up. <laughs> I just, I love what I do and I love the, the instrument. And um, so to this day, also all my drum kits are orange. So Keith Moon is what started me playing. And uh, my first real, okay. I had all great drum teachers, but my favorite was a guy named Joe Franco. Mm. And he's still one of my favorite drummers on the planet. Um, and I was a big Neil Peart fan. Like I got into Rush when I was very young, but there was a transition period when I was playing for maybe four years. Everybody was playing like Neil Peart at the time. Yeah. Even when you go to a club to do, do a gig, the drummers, I mean, I remember I needed like two cars. I had six, eight, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, you know, the whole, and I, it would take like three hours to set up, but I would do it. You know, For a 40 minute gig, for a half an hour gig. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so Neil Peart was a huge influence. I was so into Neil Peart that I would, uh, you know, I wanted to stay home from school to play Rush albums all day. Right. Uh, this is a terrible story. I would chew pretzels and spit them in the toilet and tell my mother, Ma, I threw up. I vomited. <laughs> Look. Oh, no problem. John, you could stay home today. Right down to the basement and practice Neil Pert and Rush. That was my trip. <laughs> After a while, she realized, why are all the pretzels gone? And she caught me. <laughs> but um, uh, even my brother, uh, you know, I was very young. I couldn't grow a mustache yet. But my brother had... Uh, no, my brother had like this dirty blonde color hair. So we would, when he would get a haircut, I would steal some of the hair from the floor and tape it to my face and make a Neil Peart mustache. And oh, go the practice. handlebar thing. <laughs> exactly. And I would go practice and I had the Neil Peart stash. So my brother's like, what are you taking my hair for? Uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> but there was a time in New York um, when I was young where every drama was playing like Peart. And it hit me. I said, I want to be original. I mean, I wrote Swimming in the Pool, that hit, you know? Right, right. <laughs> I said, I want to be an original. So I got away from Pert and went to Bozio. I discovered Terry Bozio, mm. which is even a bigger drum set. But yeah. But so, so basically, like, I kind of blend all my favorites together. It's Joe Franco, uh, Terry Bozio, Keith Moon, and Phil Collins. Those are my big four. Right. And of course, Pert and the other guys, you can't. You know, it's like talking about Pink Floyd. You don't have to mention The Wall yeah. as one of the great, the great albums. That's just a given. So yeah. that's me with Neil Peart. Yeah. And when it comes to like drum solos, as a concert I love player, them. yeah, no, the only, the only drum solos I could, you know, enjoy in a live setting are Alex Van Halen and Neil Peart. Any and other who? ones that you think about? Because Wait, a lot Van of times Halen? it just steals from the songs. I don't know. That's that's my guess anyway. Perfect. One more time. I heard Alex Van Halen and who? And Neil Peart. Oh, yeah. Neil Peart. Yeah, I mean, it's part, of, it's part of the act. It's part of the whole thing. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, drum solo, you got to really, um, I don't know, you could lose people. You heard on the Union Radio <laughs> album, I did Pretzel, right? Pretzel's <laughs> kind of making fun of when, when it's a drum solo. Mm. People go get a hot dog or a pretzel. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> but it, it's, it, you really got to keep their attention. And there's ways to do it. You know, you, if you go super, super sick, they're going to watch you, but they're going to go get a pretzel a couple of yeah. minutes later. So the you got to try it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you could make some kind of melody or a groove. I was never one of these guys, like, it was an 80s thing. There's a big crowd, and you're like, now this side of the... Like, right. that, that always annoyed me, so I don't do that to keep the crowd. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, if you, if you just try to involve them uh, and make, make your solo musical, I think... Yeah. Uh, you can keep them. Yeah, call and response type of thing. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. John, you did you did the um review on Union Radio, right? No, I mean on the Mike Romeo album, right? Uh no, it was a fellow of ours, uh John Coquel. Oh, okay. Sorry, it's another John. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do well, I do most of the metal stuff, but I missed out on that one. I was tied up with a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> no, I get you, I get you. All right, no problem. So I'm going to kind of put you on the spot with this one here. I'm going to go into one of your uh, more obscure acts. Do it. All right, one of your more unique projects was the mid 2000s multinational industrial metal band Masterlast. Masterlast, and unbelievable. 
Yeah, now that was a little bit of a different thing than the other stuff that you've done. So could you get into sort of the uh, different techniques you employed? And was there anything about that that challenged you a little bit compared to your other projects? Exactly. The first thing, drumming wise, don't do a fill. And these guys were paying me weekly, so I didn't do a fill. <laughs> no, seriously, <laughs> it, it was, it was uh, if you're going to hit them, the people, don't hit them with a fill. Hit them with a groove fill. Never mm. break that groove. Um, and what this band is, it's so cool. Um, it was, okay, in New York City, I would play every Friday in a show called The Bitch Show. And Bitch was like a very popular show in Manhattan where all girls would come up and sing metal songs. So it's like a, a live karaoke. Um, and that's where I met the singer, Lisa. So she's from Israel. Mm. And uh, she, if you close your eyes, she sounds like, Whoa! I mean, it's like the devil. It's incredible what she can do with her voice. But she can also sing, you know, beautiful. So I met her and we kept talking. We're going to do something. We're going to do something. And then she called me and she said she's working with a girl from Switzerland and a guy from Switzerland. So they put this thing together. I got the bass player. We put it all together and um, we made a demo. And the demo was killer. And from the demo, I helped them out with uh, some connections and we got a record deal on SKP Records, and I had the producer, was a guy named Fabrizio Grazzi, who played with me with Starbreaker, and a bass player, and he produced it. I loved the results, I loved it, but Fabrizio wanted us to play more, he wanted me to play more, you know, a little more interesting, not only beat, 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 and they kind of agreed, and I love it, to this day, it's one of my favorite albums, drumming-wise, sound-wise, and songs, because they're so original, but, uh, the owner of the band didn't dig it. What, like, uh, you know, I was playing more, and he loved he loved the real straight, straight, straight thing. So in the end, that mixed with um, some other things, the band broke up, and it's a shame because it was so original and so different. And we played two shows, and people flipped. So there was there was <laughs> something in that. But bands are a pain in the ass, man. Bands are not easy to keep going. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, uh, yeah it's a it's a great record. It's called. Master last, I think mastery of oneself or, but um, how did you discover that? <laughs> well, um, I am, I've been a feature writer at the Metal Archives for about a little uh, under 20 years now. And That's you can you. find everything on there. Yeah, I go by the name Hell's Unicorn. I've done several of your albums. I haven't gotten around to reviewing that album yet, but I will. <laughs> okay, I, I got a fake name too to get out of trouble, but I'll tell you. <laughs> Alan Smith, is that it? The, my, the... My, my, my name is uh, Macon D Records. <laughs> Macon, like, like you're from Georgia or something. It's a Southern American name, like Macon. And yeah. then the letter D with a period and records, R E K I T Z. And you'll some albums I actually put that name if it was really, really something I hated the mix or I didn't want to be involved. I was like, I was Macon D Records. It's not, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's pretty cool well one thing you should be proud about is that song from power mad uh, slaughterhouse which got you in a david lynch movie with uh nicholas cage laura dern that must have been a crazy experience it was unbelievable yeah it's like if, if, if you're going to be in one movie in your life that's the movie yeah. what happened was we were touring with power mad power mad for those who don't know is 1989 and i got a call from warner brothers records Mm. But this band, they were recording in New York City in the record plant, which is a gigantic studio, <coughs> and the drummer wasn't cutting it. And I don't know where they got my name, but my mother's like, uh, Warner Brothers is on the phone. I'm like, ah, it's my friend Pete. And I get on, <laughs> I'm like, what the hell you want? Oh, John, this is Warner Brothers. And they said, we need a drummer tomorrow to start recording. Wow. Can we come to your house tonight? It was like 10 o'clock at night already. So th they drove two hours and they came to my house. So about 12 o'clock. In the basement, the guy's like, play some wailing double bass, wailing double bass. So I did some wailing double bass, and the next day I was in the studio recording their album. And um, it was a strange experience because their drummer was there next to me telling me what to play. And it was before Pro Tools, and it was before Cubase, so you had to start at the beginning and play all the way through the songs. At the end, the, the drummer, you know, he's like, hey, you missed that Tom. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Again, whole song, had to play, uh, and it went on and on and on and on. And then after the whole thing was done, they got rid of the drummer, and they asked me to play live. <laughs> so it was weird. <laughs> so we went on tour, and um, 
they got a call. The manager got a call that David Lynch heard the song Slaughterhouse. Mm. Maybe. No, OK, we finished the album and we're, yeah, we're on tour. And David Lynch heard this song, but he was done with the movie. It was called Hearts of Wild or Hearts are Wild. Nicholas Cage, Laura Dern, Harry Dean Stanton, Willem Dafoe, Isabella Rossellini. I'm like, wow. wait. Yeah, so they say um, David Lynch is done with the, uh, with, with the movie, but he wants to write another scene and put us in the movie. I was like, that's crazy. So they flew the whole band from Minneapolis to L.A. And I just found out last week, I didn't remember this, but my drum tech said Nicholas Cage canceled. It was on a Sunday, and he said, I'm busy. Can we do it next Sunday? So film money is a lot more than music money. No problem, guys. Hang out in L.A. for a week. I was like, okay. So we had a free week in L.A. hanging out, going crazy. And then we did the movie shoot. Mm. And it was crazy. I've never been on a movie shoot before. It was insane. It was like so much work for one scene that would maybe last three, four minutes. And it was like over and over and over again. I didn't care because they had Dixie beer on tap. <laughs> Yeah, and I I was pre-recorded already, so I could just fake it and uh, you know drink right. beers all day. But it was amazing because I was working with David Lynch. I was a big fan, and there's Nicolas Cage and Laura Dern, and we filmed these scenes. And throughout the movie, if you see the result, they're always talking about Power Man. They're playing the song in the beginning, so it was just crazy that um, David Lynch is like that. It's kind of not over till it's over. He's still improving, and he's freaky, but he's he's brilliant. And I was impressed by um, um, Nicolas Cage because he never left that character. If you see the character in the movie, he acts like Elvis. He's got the snakeskin yeah. jacket. When we met him personally, same dude. Never took off the jacket. Not mm-hmm. nice to meet you, boys. Your boys are real good. I was like, <laughs> I asked my, somebody who knew him, like, is that the way he really talks? They're like, no, man, he's in character. <laughs> and it was brilliant. It was an amazing experience. But if you've seen the movie and you've seen like the opening scene, imagine this. My parents took my grandmother to see it before me because I was in Europe with TNT. Wow. And the album came out in America first. So my mother calls me, oh, my God, John, we took grandma to the movie. And it was like the opening scene. And, uh, you know, <laughs> there's sex and his brains on the floor. And, uh, wow. oh, my God, what a movie. I was like, I can't wait to see it. <laughs> you know. Thank you for spoiling it. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, I mean, it was, it was just a brilliant experience. I mean, uh. And they got me in SAG, the Screen Actors Guild. There's people oh, working wow. their whole lives to get in SAG. They put me in. But I never got another call. Oh, it'll happen. happen. It'll I'm happen. just doing this drumming thing to pay for my acting career. For now. For <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah, but it was a brilliant uh, experience, bro. Yeah. Really. Wild at heart. Right. Go ahead, Jonathan. All right. So we got another one here. All right. One of my favorite projects in which you've been involved in uh, fairly recently is uh, Atlantica. So did you have any uh, takeaways from the process of creating Across the Seven Seas, uh, working with uh, uh, Mr. West on vocals? And it's been about 10 years now. Is there ever going to be a second album or is that uh, project permanently on hiatus? <laughs> well, it, it's um, Roger Stoffelbach's, um project mm. uh, and John West, pretty much. Um, and then Mysteria and me. Um, I, I love that record. I love the mix. I love the playing, the whole thing. But I'm not sure about a second album, but I did record Roger's solo album. And they're mixing it now, and it's really good. It, it's a guitar record, but it's not like the typical guitar records where you got the shuffle beat, then you got the blues beat, and then you got the like the nasty shuffle boom. It's not one of those records. It's a metal record, mm. but a guitar metal record. It's re- it's tasty, and I'm really happy with that. Um, yes, I mean Roger Stoffelback, the solo album is going to come out, and Johnny West, I love man. I mean he's like such a great guy. Every time we get together, we just laugh. And uh, but I'm not sure about a second album. I mean, if there is, hopefully they call me because that's a cool band. <laughs> Yeah. yeah and uh, are you happy being an independent artist that you are like just doing solo stuff and you know contract stuff or given the choice would you put together a band again great question man yeah i always okay i dedicated my life at a young age to making records mm. you know i, I said because i knew records were for life and a live gig comes and goes and you might have five people there 
Yeah. The truth about the band thing is Van Halen never called. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm going to join a band, they got to be kick ass. Right. I, play with some, I play with some great bands, but I mean, to join a band, it's got to be like ridiculous. So I rather, I rather concentrate on making albums. And, you know, I started my own band, which was Arc. And as brilliant as the, as brilliant as the music is, it was a pain in the ass. And I, I see why some of the band leaders can be real boneheads because, uh, and that's a nice word, because <laughs> when there's a problem, they come right to you. And me and Toro were the owners of Arc. And when there was problems with this or that or that, boom, they were coming to us and we had to solve them. And like, what, what's going on here? I just want to play drums, you know? <laughs> and, you know it's, it's not easy to have a band, but I think I do want to make a band because like being a session player, Honestly, I got to say, I love it, but it gets lonely. There's so many great session drummers, which you never heard of, or you can't. It's like, um, it's like, can you pick out the guys in Boston if they were walking down the street? <laughs> right. No. I mean, it's like Rick Morata, Jerry Morata. Uh, you know, can you pick these guys out on the street? And they played on every song from Steely Dan all, all through the 70s. And I'm, yeah. So it's a lonely thing being a studio drummer. I draw faces and I put them on the walls. <laughs> So I keep you company, yeah. yeah, yeah, company. But um, it's lonely. But in the end, you have a benefit because you leave a history behind you. Yeah, you know, people might not have seen that gig. It's like the fish that got away. You should have seen it. Yeah, you know? got it. But, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, studio work is where it's at for me. And right. I just, I, I just opened up my new recording studio. And oh, you I guys, see. I gotta tell you, I gotta thank you guys for something. But I'll tell you that in a second. Okay, okay. Well, I think Jonathan has a question about Labyrinth. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yep, yep. Another one here. I'm, I'm also the resident power, European power metal junkie over at Sonic Perspectives, and I have been at the Metal <laughs> Archive since the early 2000s. So um, I got to compliment you on fabulous work uh, with the uh, Labyrinth album. Uh, I love it. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, could you get uh, just a little bit into the uh, experience of recording that album? And I also just wanted to ask on the side, did you make contact with them through uh, your previous work with uh, Pierre uh, Gen uh, Ganella, I think his name was, is, with Master Castle? Is that how that uh, kind of formed? Or <laughs> No, when, when I was recording with Pierre, though, I saw, I, I, I haven't heard of Labyrinth until I came to Italy. So I never heard of Labyrinth. I, it was my wife's favorite movie with David Bowie, you know what I mean? <laughs> So, so um, I went to Pierre's house. We were recording, and he had all these labyrinth backstage passes and all this shit. I was, I was like, "Labyrinth? You play with Labyrinth, right?" I heard the name lately, but I, you know, I haven't heard the music. So, no. What happened was I got a call from a. Uh, okay, my buddy, the guy who mix, the guy who mixes the Romeo records is Simone Maloney, a great friend. He's a guitar player for DGM. He recommended me. He told um the guys at Frontiers and Elio from Frontiers. Um, they got in touch with me and it's interesting because I got together with these guys and we did like a, a like a you know kind of a rehearsal for the record over in Geneva and the band just boom it locked in and it's not easy to do that stuff even though it's you know it's got an 80s thing obviously but you'll be if you're interested in the album you'll be interested in this um, before we actually made the record I went to Jennifer and uh, Jennifer Jennifer, and I was hanging out with uh, Olaf, the guitar player, and we sat down and we were listening to his demos. And I was like, "Dude, I mean, it's to to do a new album." Do get do get I said, "No matter how much power metal people are out there, it's not enough. You got to change it a little, man. Let me just give me freedom, and I'm going to show you something really special." And he said, well, they tell me now, tell me now. So I pulled up Arc, um, Absolute Zero. And I said, listen to this. It's still metal. It's still 16th notes, but I'm doing a jungle groove. Now with double bass. It's the same feel. And he said, do it, do it, do it. So that was one thing cool. Like he was cool enough to take the idea and he knew at that time, if we're going to go do it, do it, do it, do it, every song, you're just going to lose people. So they were open enough to let me do my thing. And, you know, they really loved it. And I love that album. But this is an interesting thing. Um, 
Olaf starts to ask me about a song named Feel. He goes, it's the only instrumental on our album. It came from a dance song, like a metal type. Okay. Now, years later, yeah, I think we were in Japan, and uh, somebody was talking about Slaughterhouse. And I started to sing the riff. Digga, 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 and he turns to me, he goes, wait a minute. That's where I got the idea for the song Feel. I go, that's me, Bonehead. He goes, that's you? I said, yeah. So he didn't know it was Power Mad and I was the drummer. So I'm playing with him for two years or whatever, a year, and he didn't know I'm the drummer on the song that influenced their album. So that was pretty cool. And Labyrinth album, Architecture of God, is also the first album where I blended my electronic drums on the drum kit. So I had a big acoustic kit with a Korg wave drum, an electric pedal, and an electric snare drum. So when I did the jungle stuff, I actually did it between acoustic and electric. And I think it worked. I think it worked. It worked beautifully. Uh, you threw a little bit of a Mark Zonder thing in there. And that's one of the exactly. observations I always made about Labyrinth. Their singer, Roberto, reminds me a ton of Ray Adler back in the day. And I'm thinking parallels when I hear that album. I'm, you know, you know, all the, you know, the mixture of the electronic and uh, the acoustic drumming. I mean, it was, it was just the whole thing was beautiful from start to finish. <laughs> Thanks so much. And the, the crazy thing is with Power Mad, we went on the Fates Warning tour for that album. And yeah. it was, I was opening up for Mark Zond. I'm like, who is this dude? It was <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. And then I, through that, I met Ray and everything. So it's funny you say that because yeah, yeah we, we went on tour with that band. Um, yeah, I mean, um, it, it's a really cool album, uh, especially like the title track. It's beautiful. And, you know, the beginning is... Uh, you know, you can really hear the electronic and the acoustic drums mixed. And song-wise, it's a beautiful track, you know? So in the end, I think that we didn't do every song, dooga, 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 we kept two. <laughs> yeah. I, think it, I think it really helped, you know? I mean, don't get me wrong, I love that stuff, but there's a time you have to, you know... You have to uh, yeah, European power metal has been kind of enslaved to the, uh, to the ghost of Halloween for a long time, so you got to <laughs> up a little there. <laughs> 100%. 100%. Yeah. So true, man. Yeah, I mean, I love metal, but I mean, I can't say I listen to it. I mean, I mean, I, if I'm going to pop on a metal tune, it's probably going to be like, you know, a, from Screaming to Vengeance or something, you know, bring back <coughs> memory. It's not in my record collection, basically because so much stuff is done like a dance album now. It's done fake. It's quantized everything. Everything's put in line. The tools we use to correct are now the standard auto tune, uh, you yeah. know. But, so I don't know. I'm kind of down on metal. They mix the cymbals too low. It's like the standard, which uh, I don't know how metal, which was the purest thing when I was growing up, has become the fakest thing. Is that a word, <laughs> fakest? Yeah, what, but uh, I 100% understand and agree with you for sure. Yeah. 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 Well, I want to talk about your book uh, soon, but before we go into that, let's go to more organic dr organic sounding drummers. You mentioned Joe Franco, who, who taught you in the beginning, but also you, you practiced with uh, Rod Morgenstein and Tommy Aldridge. Yeah. What was it like to have classes with established players like that? I mean, uh, Rod Morgenstein now is a great friend. And the mm. funny thing is, as much as I talk to him, he still doesn't remember me taking lessons with him. He said, it's impossible. I was in Florida. I'm like, no, you are the real Rod Morgenstein. I mean, there's not another one. It was you. But I was really young when I studied with him because I was lucky enough in New York to grow up in New York. I grew up in Long Island. So it was cool because drummers had basements. When you got think it. about it, they don't have that in Manhattan. I don't know how the Manhattan guys got so good. You know? <laughs> um, so there was a drum store which would have favorite, famous drummers come in and I would take lessons. So Rod came in. And I did like a package of lessons with him. Joe Franco, I studied for years with him. But the craziest one was um, uh, Tommy Aldridge came in. And I'm like, oh my God, Tommy Aldridge. <laughs> and we did two days of lessons. And dude, you don't even have to pick up the sticks to enjoy your lesson with him. Because he's like from Texas and he has all, the, everything is like these phrases, like these funny phrases. And right. I could just listen to him. To, and he's talking rock history. He was telling us about Ozzy, telling us about the problems with this band. So it was more like this history lesson, which I loved, and a couple of licks. And, um, but an interesting story I got from him was growing up in Texas, this is legendary when you think about it, if you're an Aldridge fan, 
He didn't learn it from John Bonham to play with his hands. He played with his hands because his father was very strict. And his father said, no drumming tonight or no drumming tomorrow. You know, stop, stop playing. And he had to practice. So he took, he practiced in his basement with the hands. So he wouldn't, um, he wouldn't upset the family upstairs. I mean, that's brilliant information. Of course. Yeah. yeah it, it was worth the money for the lesson. Yeah. You know what I mean, but, yeah. um, so he, but I was lucky enough to have this, this store, which had all famous drummers coming in. Yeah. I was, you know, really lucky to have that. Yeah. Huh? Well, speaking of famous drummers, we lost Alan White of Yes a oh, couple of days God. ago. Yeah. Was he an influence of yours? I mean, Yes is one of those bands which if I ever get depressed or like something really went wrong, I'm like, what am I going to do? I <laughs> pop on Yes. Yes saves me. <laughs> It gives me life, and I have to look at the cover. I need to see the artwork because it's all connected. And that yeah. artwork brings me back to my childhood when you didn't, you didn't know what a problem was. You know, I was lucky to have a great childhood like that. But the crazy thing is my favorite Yes album, again, you don't have to mention The Wall, so I don't have to mention Fragile. But my yeah. favorite album after that is Tomato. And so many Yes fans just lost that one. They don't want to hear it. I'm like, no, of this course. is the, it's the deepest. And it brings back the best memories because I got it for Christmas the year I started drumming. So Alan White was a huge drumming influence. And uh -huh. Tomato is one of my favorite records. Uh, it's just a shame. I mean, when you think about it, you got Neil Peart. Like all the biggest gigantic influences have gone. You know, yeah. Peart, Eddie Van Halen, and now Alan White. Yeah. I mean, I, Bruford is a more of a drum influence than Alan White for me, but Alan White, uh, I can't explain it, man. Both of those drummers were brilliant for yes. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah. And cool. so speaking of your book, uh, you're going to explore the, one of the techniques that you made popular in rock and metal, linear drumming, right? Exactly. And the, the book is called United Sounds of Separation, right? Exactly. United Sounds of Separation. Um, For anyone who doesn't know, linear drumming is when no two notes hit at the same time. So everything right. is separate. So if you take a beat, Queen will rock you, dom, dom, ba, dom, dom, ba. Mm. Now you're going to convert it to 16th notes. will be da, 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 da. But if I hit a bass drum or a snare, I, uh, okay, here's an easy way to describe it. Boom, boom, bop. I have to fill in the holes between the boom, boom, and the bop. They got or walk this way, Ira Smith. It sounds mechanical and stiff until you bring it to life and you start to play melodies. And always, here's the key to the book: the groove remains the same. A little right. bit of a little Zeppelin mix, because if you want to do something interesting in your band, and they're like, "Dude, don't do that drum stuff," you know. <laughs> You can do the linear stuff. You're playing drum stuff, but they don't even realize it because they still hear boom, boom, bop. So user-friendly, band-friendly beats. And in the book, okay, so United, now when you start taking all those notes and putting them together, the hi-hat, the bass drum, the snare, everything is separate, but now in the end, it's United. So it's United Sounds of Separation. Ooh, so creep. Cool. <laughs> yeah but i mean so linear and it actually came i mean the history i'm not really sure but it, it's a lot of the gospel drummers are doing it and mm. not ma not many of the metal guys were doing it at all i started using it on the first arc album and you know apps no i'm um, burn the sun is full of it and the romeo yeah. albums are full of it the new romeo album it's like linear everywhere because romeo yeah. said just follow my kicks You can do what you want. I wrote the stuff with you in mind. But if I go, don't, 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 Mm -hmm. And I do drum and bass, I do double bass, I do uh, techno, I do straight rock, I do a section which is really cool, taking your favorite drummer's beats and converting them to linear. Oh, that's uh, so cool. Yeah. yeah, so it's like it's, uh, uh, 23 chapters of hopefully 
stuff that you can use or you've never heard before. And I'm doing a video with it because if you hear it on record, you don't know what the hell is going on. Yeah. The right hand's all over you. So I'm, there's a video that's going to come with it or I'm going to put out, you know. Okay. Yeah. Is there a release date yet or not? What was that? Is there a release date for the book and, and the videos and whatnot? Yeah. Um, uh, the, uh, the 2018 <laughs> it was it was supposed to be out but i'm too picky man it's like the solo album it took a year and a half this right. has been this has been almost 10 years writing wow <laughs> but yesterday i finished the physical writing oh wow okay. you know the writing so like all this now i have to have somebody type it so it's legible <laughs> and and then all the examples are done so all i have to do basically is get this typed out uh edit what I'm not going to use, send it to the guy, he types it out, and I'm ready to go. So gotcha. basically, like, a lot of the gospel guys use this, and now some of the prog and metal guys use it, but it's still, there's different ways to use it in my book. There's all different ways. Not one chapter is the same. It's all new methods. So check it out. You can, you can, um, you can check out all my stuff on johnmacaluso.com. I have a new website. It's oh, yeah. got all this stuff. And I'm also doing online lessons now, Rodrigo, if you want to play some drums, you know? <laughs> cool. Yeah. So JohnMichaelUso.com. I got all the stuff there, you know, oh, all the information excellent. for online lessons and, you know. Yeah. Well, to finish it off, uh, in parallel with everything that we discussed, you have a few dates with Jennifer Batten in Europe in November. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Her fusion material is just insane. Super weird in the best sense of the word, right? Yeah, she's amazing. It's one of the best guitarists on the planet, and she's yeah. so fun. I mean, I come back with abs because I laugh so much. I'm like, Urgh. you know those abs. Those abs are so 80s. Yeah, but I start getting abs when I'm with Jennifer because you're just nonstop laughing. She's right. so funny, a brilliant guitarist. And I mean, I say it all the time. She went from Michael Jackson. She's on the Bed Tour, which is yeah. the biggest tour on the planet. Then she goes and plays with Jeff Feck, her hero, and then she's driving around with me in like a smart car. I'm like, oh, your career is on the rise. She's going up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but what, she's the best. And we're going to want, but this time we're using a vocalist. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we got to Michael guy. Jackson stuff as well or not? No, but we throw beat it, guitar solo in right. once in a while, you know. Um, right. But no, it's, um, it's a great show. It's not the fusion thing, playing songs, but her way. She changes it and it's really cool. So November we're playing through Europe. We got I think eleven or twelve dates. Yeah. But let me um, let me tell you. Mm. Uh, okay, so I have the recording studio now, and I'm yeah. thinking, uh, drummers only care about like. Okay, here's an example. Jonathan, if you you play bass, you call me and go, dude, I got a new. You and you say I got a new bass, and I go, okay, okay, what color? The, the drummer cares about what the thing looks like. You know what I mean? <laughs> so. Uh, also, names are very important. So I finally got the equipment. I have a recording studio now. Again, if anybody's interested in having me record stuff, everything is on the website. Where to, you know, the phrase is hire me now so you don't have to hire me later. <laughs> JohnMichaelUzzo.com. <laughs> you can check out all the info. But, so I needed a studio name. And I'm like, what can I do? What can I do? I, I don't know who the guy was, but do you remember... That I this is how I met Joel. Um, hmm. Somebody, one of the guys at Sonic Perspectives, did a, a review on the Romeo album, War of the Worlds Part One, and he wrote, "I like John McAlusa's playing. I just don't understand why he's on the credits because it's obviously programmed." And I flipped out. You remember that? It's Alan, Alan Cox. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. I don't think he meant it like that, but yes. Holy God. we talked many times now and he, he's a cool super dude and like I, all respect but i freaked me out i was like oh my god because i put so much work into making it sound that way right so it, but he's not the only dude who who said that mm. all right and i worked my whole life to play that way i could also play very backwards no, not backwards very backbeat right but when a couple of people started to say that they thought this album you know was programmed or something I said, oh, okay, I'm, I'm accused of being a drum machine. So, like the movie 2001, remember the HAL 9000? Hello, yeah. everyone. Okay, yeah. so the studio is the Mac 9000, like it's an old drum machine. So I'm calling it wow. Studio Mac 9000. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> I 
There you go. Like, like, you like go. I'm a drum machine, the Mac 9000. Call the Mac 9000. Yes. Yeah, so You'll be happy Mac. to know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Send me his mail. I want to write to him and thank him. Will do. Yeah. Now, he, seems like, he seems like a great guy, man. He's, He's the good. nicest guy, man. He's yeah. the nicest guy. We're going to call him to join the call, but he couldn't do it. But yeah, maybe next time. Yeah. Super cool. Super yeah. cool, man. Hey, you, well, guys are great. you guys are great. I appreciate it. Yeah, I want to thank you for your time, man. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed so you tour on this side of the pond. So we yeah, can I mean, Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. hoping to get up to, uh, I'm hoping to get back to uh, New York to visit my family in July. Oh. But you're, you're a bit of a hike from uh, New York. Yes, yeah. We'll see what we can do. Just one. <laughs> we'll figure right. something out, man. Yeah. But uh, right. thank you. Thank you all. This thank you, great. John. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Uh -huh.